Drake, it's so good to see you again. We kind of meet every year or so at these conferences. That's one of the beauties. <laughs> Our long-standing friendships get to be renewed. Exactly. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your life in dyslexia and your professional life and your life as IDA president and what you've done beyond that. Um, when did you first acquire an interest in dyslexia? Well, in behavior and in language as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan and as a psychology major pre-medical student. But it really wasn't until my time at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I don't think it was still as a resident, but only after I joined the staff at the level of an instructor, that I got to know Paula Rome. And as you know, Paula was such a guru with regards to dyslexia. and put me in touch with the open society, as it was called at that time. And as you recall, and I think is a characteristic that certainly was part of this organization at that time, and I hope permeates it still, there was a kind of elegance, depth, historical awareness that permeated the Orton society. And it wasn't just this veneration for an individual or a personality. It had to do with a veneration for science, a technological approach to educational problems, and all of it done with elegance, verve, and human compassion that was irresistible. I don't think there was anyone who got close to that genre of membership of this organization it included the great Margaret Ross and Roger Saunders. These people had such depth to them that when they spoke, they spoke with such passion, yet with such knowledge, that it was irresistible. And they drew me into further study, as well as my own kids having their own problems with regards to reading acquisition. So they got some tutorial assistance through Paula and her staff. But she was the one that really guided me, and I was very, very fortunate to be in that city at that time. Exactly. Lots of us were, I think. Yes. Um, and when was this? Was this like in the late 60s, early 70s? Do you recall? Right. It was uh, maybe 68, 69. She had me do something in Rochester mm -hmm. and at a state level. And then uh, my first... Orton Society meeting was, I think, 1970. It would be 70 or 71 in Boston. And that reinforced all my earlier impressions. Boston, of course, is such an educational mecca. And it has such history for us in this country. The presentation of Norman Geshwin and sitting beside me, the great C.K. Leong, who would be an inspiration to me for his dedication and thoroughness throughout my professional life and the collaboration that we did on, on more than one occasion. And I'll never forget that wonderful reception that was held at the Isabella Gardner Museum in Boston. So perfect, so again, elegant, that typified my perception of this organization and to hear the great Norman Geshwin talk about the situation of the brain, its, its asymmetries that were wrapped the audience in Boston. But when he presented that material, and I was in the audience as a kid and fascinated by this description of hemispheric asymmetry of the temporal plane. And as we walked out of the meeting room, hearing my seniors talk about it was the deaner's knife that was crooked and it was not it was an artifact and it, it broke my heart literally because people were so resistant in medicine and neurology to these new concepts and that was what one of the things that that was a struggle for for norm is that his ideas were so nouveau novel in the way he approached things and so clever and his a willingness 
to cast aside preconceptions and let data speak for itself that was impressive to a young person, and he was an inspiration so far as all the work I've ever done. You, you've mentioned several mentors of yours already in the field of education, Paula Rome and C, the professor C.K. Leong, and then of course in neurology, um, Norm Geshwin. Were there other mentors, either in the medical field or the education, uh, biomedical field that that were mentors to you or that ex, you know excited your interest in dyslexia I think the opportunity that I was given as president of this organization to serve on the committees of the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development that reviewed a number of the sites that were funded for long-term studies of reading disability provided for me an opportunity to see some of the best people in the country evaluate their work and to learn from them firsthand. It was a, a remarkable opportunity. Some of the founders of the organization, I'll never forget the night I was taken by Jeanette Jansky in New York to Katrina de Hirsch's apartment. And again, the, the sense of the depth of this woman and this genre Loretta Bender, who was a colleague of theirs. I mean, these famous names in psychology and neurology and medicine who were familiar with each other. And this was the hotbed that was the birth of the Orton idea and of that organization. Uh, it, it was just so impressive. Jeanette Jansky herself, um, Alice's Palace. Uh, what a charming, Alice Kunz was just, you know, so vivacious and so spontaneous and so giving and generous. Uh, so many of the people who in various corners of the United States had taken Orton Gillingham principles and applied them, Alpha Beta Phonics down in Texas, that later went back east to Columbia and was used by Teachers College there. Just so many, it's impossible to name them all because it was like my experience as a resident at Mayo, which had at the time the largest neurology department in the world, that as a student, I could take from each one of the staff some element of their approach to neurology and as a result come out as a consummate individual who had a little bit of each of them. And that's what I got from this organization. I was very young when they handed me the opportunity to be the president of this group. I mean, that's why I'm still here. I was a kid who would have, and I, I'm joke not. It was this opportunity we had to create the first International Congress on Dyslexia at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. What an august meeting that was. The weather was perfect in that northern part of the United States. It was sunny and warm. Only the last day was there some rain and the chill moved in, but the geese loved it. And <laughs> I, I remember the, that was 1974. Right. And you were instrumental in that meeting. And I was that when you uh, interviewed McDonald Critchley? Yes. I, I thought that must be. I had just um, reviewed that tape. And what a moment in history that was for oh, you we, as a young uh, neurologist speaking with the guru of the. World and at our banquet neurology. that night, we had the president of the World Federation of Psychiatry in Howard, Howard P. Rome, Rome mm -hmm. and the president of the World Federation of Neurology in McDonald Critchley. I mean, how many times does that occur? Yeah, it was a wonderful event. Um, and I know that you have continued your interest in dyslexia, but in other um, disorders as well. Could you describe some of the other work you're doing now? Well, it started in 83 when at Mayo we came upon the idea of creating a learning disabilities assessment program. And I was part of the group that were involved in putting that together. And it became obvious that when physicians were in a referral situation, the kinds of children they saw were seldom the pure reading disabled child. Because without attentional problems, they're well behaved kids so they don't get sent to a doctor. But once you're in a medical setting and have a wide spectrum of patients you start to see, you see a more heterogeneous and perhaps more reflective population of those who really do need medical attention. And that expanded when I moved from Rochester to Scottsdale and had the professorship 
at Arizona State University, which turned out to be a very happy association, and to develop a training program where undergraduate students in the Barrett College, which is an advanced college subgroup within ASU's program, the pre-med students would be interviewed by us and there would be a small cadre that would become interns and spend a semester with us and be graded on it. And from that group we would pick those that would remain with us for one or two or three years and they would get an opportunity to do some research. Uh, and that, because when I went there, the goal was to create in my two interest areas, developmental disorders and a kind of movement disorder called dystonia a rigor in collecting data so that every patient could be a research case. And indeed, every patient we see signs of release that, while protecting their identity, their records become available for retrospective analysis. So we have a very large group of Tourette's patients, and it's a fascinating condition, where seldom is reading a major issue for, for that population. But musical giftedness Motor speech difficulties are common problems, and of course the psychiatric comorbidity. Perhaps it was in part because of Howard's influence, Howard P. Rome's influence, and his son, Jeff, who uh, became very close to me, and his wife, who she of course was involved with the Reading Center in, in Rochester, that these psychiatric, social, emotional components and if there's anything that has enriched the work that I do, it is this sensitivity to the emotional state of the students we work with, which by most of us in neurology is neglected and in some instances is over-focused on by those who are in psychiatry. So we've been able to add neuropsychology, psychiatry to the work that we do in neurology, looking at the physiology. In fact, it was very interesting at that prophetic meeting in 1976 or 78 at Early House, Virginia, where we were discussing the possibility of a, a research program which would be an anatomic post-mortem study of the brains of individuals who in life had been dyslexic. It was Loretta Bender who piped in, and don't forget the EEG. <laughs> and, and we haven't, and that proved to be very uh, useful information where we've shown that a large percentage of kids have these anomalous EEG patterns, but they again only reinforce the organicity, the biological basis. They don't represent a risk like epilepsy for the vast, vast majority of them, but give us clues as to the underlying cause. And we've done a lot, I think, in the pervasive developmental disorders as well, where obsessive compulsiveness, math calculation, and attention problems have been issues. So it's, it, it's, it's been a, a broadening experience. And I have to say that it's a relief when somebody comes in with a back pain or a headache, and this young man I know is dyslexic. And it's, I have a writing sample of everybody that I see, and I look at how they write, and the hand posture as they write, the speed of their writing, and have made diagnoses of dyslexia in individuals who didn't come in for that reason. And, uh, you know, it's Martha Denkla, who was another inspiration, who developed the quantitative neurologic examination, who made the statement that all dyslexic boys are good looking. She has a dyslexic boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, Let's kind of switch gears and talk a bit about your time as president of the Orton Society in those days. Um, and what year did you take over as president? 1976. Okay. 76 so, through 80. All right. And what were um, some of the issues you faced at that time, do you recall? Vividly. Um, number one, coming into this Baltimore, Washington International Airport. I saw the sign for Towson, Maryland, and of course the early headquarters were in Towson. And it was a much smaller group, a much more intimate group, and a much more dedicated group with regards to the philosophy of education and how it had to be so pure, and there could not be any commercial contamination, which was a very strong element of the organization at that time, and is a good principle to follow at, at whatever level. But it was an organization that was uneven in its membership as to the size of the various branches, the depth of background of the various branches, 
and a large branch, and my, my friends in New York will understand this, and only a few of them will perhaps remember this era, but there was discontent among our colleagues in, in New York at that time uh, because it seemed to them they were providing so much to the organization and getting perhaps less than they should have. And so I made a couple of trips to New York to, to meet with individuals to lessen the risk that there might be a division within the organization, which would have been a tragic loss. I mean, they were a very, very important group. I mean, it was the founding home, if you will. I mean, that's where Sam Orton did his work at Columbia. And, and that fortunately got resolved. And there was the emerging strength at that time of the branch council, which peaked, I think, when Bill Ellis took over from me in 1980 as president of the organization. So it was a transitional period. And it was a time also when we were able to host that meeting at Early House, where I got a chance to meet with Norm and outside of an empty fall swimming pool at Early House for about two hours, Norm Geshwin, this great professor at Harvard, tells this instructor of neurology at the Mayo Medical School his life story. And there was a very curious relationship between him and McDonald Critchley. Both of them were at this meeting. And they sat at the same end of the table, but at some distance from each other. And it was not Norm's problem from the standpoint he was a very gracious and open and accepting kind of person. But he'd gotten some of his training, you know, in England, and his wife was a British nurse. So there was some ill will on the part of our most senior member and this genius from America that I had to manage and all these other very, very bright people around that table. But it ended with, in 1980, the $75,000 we had as a down payment from the 150 from the Underwood Foundation to start the Brain Bank, which has been a very important step, not only in dyslexia, because it started the movement that when we had imaging capabilities with magnetic resonance imaging, where morphometrics, the volumetric assessment of different regions of the brain, which is hot news now, even in our area of movement disorders. And in the studies I've done with the music in the brain, there are some characteristic changes that musicians trained from early in life, in depth, have that change their organization, their nervous system, that the work with dyslexia actually was the forerunner of all of that. Well, that's fascinating that you mentioned the brain bank because we don't hear much about it now at this point, and I know those brains are still there, uh, many of them waiting to be autopsied. So I don't know where we stand now. Do you know where we are? My understanding is that there are five male, three female nervous systems that have come to examination, and they've been reported in the literature. Right, right. Whether there are new ones that are being added to that collection, I'm not aware of, because I think the funding for that program came to an end as the NICHD funding in dyslexia and related disorders was uh, waning. But the, you're right, the material should still be there in the laboratory. And Al Galliberta, of course, is the one who could inform us about that. Right. Um, what, what expertise do you think was helpful of your own, was helpful to you to, uh, as, brand, uh, as uh, board president? What skills did you bring? I think one thing that was an advantage was the fact that I was a physician and a neurologist. And that gave me automatic entree. Uh, there was a time when this group met in Baltimore and Mrs. Orton was in the audience. And I was told that she said after my presentation, it's Sam all over again. And uh, I don't know how broadly accepted that was, but I think what it represented was the fact that this was an organization that looked to medical leadership uh, because it was medically oriented. And as a consequence, I think I was accepted as well as having the fortune of, the good fortune of being part of the staff at Mayo, where Paula Rome and her husband were, was an obvious advantage as well. 
from a personal standpoint, I think the fact that I try to bring people together and don't favor division, uh, they saw as uh, a possible positive attribute. And because of my early life experience in doing um, radio and television work uh, in high school, uh, that really was an advantage for me as a public speaker. And so doing presentations, uh, although like everybody else, I get a little nervous beforehand, uh, uh, once I start, I feel comfortable in, in that circumstance. And so I think those were advantages, my profession, uh, my professional association, uh, uh, my cohesiveness, as well as uh, I, th I hope I have always projected the image that although I may hold a professorship, I remain a student. And I learn from every person that I interact with, whether it be even at a dinner or social setting, everyone has something to teach me. And uh, I think that attitude is one I hope I encourage in the students who work with me, 30 of whom now have careers in medicine and many of them already have made very positive contributions. And I'm not even talking about the ones when we created the Mayo Medical School, but since coming to Arizona, some of the young people who have gone on to careers out of our training program have been very, very meaningful for me. Great. Um, am I correct that the makeup of the board when you were president was primarily teachers, um, educators, some professors, I think of Isabel Liberman and others, um, but were most of them educators and you were the only physician on the, the board? I think at that early time, that's correct. Uh -huh. And there were, of course, people who had business expertise who would then play a role as treasurer or an advisory role with regards to the economics of the organization, which were always fragile. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I, because I know you so well, I, I know that you are, in essence, a Renaissance man. And I, could you talk a bit about your other interests in music and dance, uh, all the things you do for the arts uh, in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area? Well, even as a kid, I, I, I studied clarinet and went to a high school that although there were several curricula, you had the opportunity to participate in music, but they were semi-pro kids and I, I wasn't that dedicated or good at music. And in recent years, I've taken up the piano uh, <laughs> with fragility. <laughs> but uh, I've always been impassioned by music uh, and made a DVD about the brain of music based on some work that's been done by the New York Academy of Sciences, which I'm a member of and uh, attended a meeting they had last year on the use of music for therapy. And it, it's a remarkable tool that we need to look at and Ina Krauss at Northwestern who I visited when our IDA meeting was in Chicago. I went to her office which is just below that of Doris Johnson. Okay. But Doris was not there at the time. But So Doris was still active uh, at the Searle building on that wonderful campus on the shores of Lake Michigan. And Ina was, showed me this, played a recording of Ina Kleine Nacht music, boom, 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 boom. And then a brain recording. <laughs> and then showed me how in reading instruction, where I would have predicted tonality and pitch perception would have been important, it's rhythm, they have shown, that in kids that are three, four, five years of age, if they master that, that's an advantage so far as acquisition to decoding, which was a surprise, but I, I trust her. I think she's a solid investigator. But I've been uh, active on the board of the uh, Phoenix Symphony. I have brought uh, Steve Frucht from New York twice, who's talked about musicians to Estonia. Uh, Leon Fleischer, who had that condition, it was improved when his forearm was injected with botulinum toxin. I brought the use of botulinum toxin to Arizona for dystonia 19. What it would have been 89 that we started treating dystonia with that, that form of treatment. Uh, I'm active with the ballet, the uh, uh, art museum. Uh, I have a collection of, of art now that I've been able to put together and create out of my interest in interior design through my studio called Creative Inspirations, exclamation mark, uh, a Palazzo Drago that I call it, that's got a very 
classical Italian feel. It's small, but it's uh, quaint and charming, and it's a lovely garden, and I, I enjoy gardens. Um, but I think the arts are essential, and I hope that as we, as a society, are so imbued with the need for quantitative thinking and use of technology, which I endorse, we should not give up the humanities or what the arts provide. They are there for a reason. Music is a social experience, and it's clear that those who have the good fortune to be exposed to musical training early in life, it benefits the architecture and function of their nervous system. And we should include in our pre- and early school programs access to music. We do that. We have an experimental program with the Phoenix Symphony in which we have a control group and a group of kids heterogeneous in their backgrounds, but in a school that's sponsored by ASU in downtown Phoenix. And we're looking at the impact of musical training on the one group versus the control group to see if that has any broad effect on specific academic uh, performances. And of course, sadly, that's what's now being taken out of most schools, the elementary music program. And uh, I remember when we were in Phoenix for the IDA meeting several years ago, um, you arranged that beautiful evening at your museum with the ballet, the opera, music, uh, I believe a woodwind quintet was there, and right. it was just one of the highlights of the entire conference. Well, I think it was important from uh, those of us who lived there to communicate that we were not as rural as some people thought, <laughs> and that there was some level of sophistication in the desert southwest. Much of it, of course, has come from the west coast or from the midwest or the northeast. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's an emerging area, and we have a lot of our ballet company and opera company, the uh, recent performance of Lucia de Lamamore was absolutely spectacular. Better than the one I saw in New York, actually. I, I, you wouldn't believe it, but in point of fact, in that instance, it was. Um, just kind of finally, I know you've done so much work worldwide. Um, and you often have talked about your associations with um, neurologists and educators, psychologists in Russia and around the world. Are you still continuing with those connections? Yes, in fact, I recently reconnected with our colleagues in Sweden, where twice I had a chance to participate in meetings that they sponsored, and one of them had the great opportunity to have luncheon with the Queen, who was a lovely woman, very, very literate, speaks excellent English, German by birth, raised in Brazil, and has a very much has a deep interest in handicapped children and was involved with Special Olympics. I've been in Hong Kong on more than two occasions, but on two occasions for purposes of training individuals. And we've had colleagues from Sweden and, and Hong Kong who have spent time with me and my staff to study the way we do our evaluations, and they've been very complimentary. Uh, in Great Britain as well, uh, where there's the commonality of language has been an advantage, obviously, but the dealing with their approach, which is not predicated on the handicapped notion to qualify for services, is both an advantage and a disadvantage. And so their white paper had to be created before there was an attention given to dyslexia as a, as a condition. Uh, in, in Russia, it's been more on my part to study the Cyrillic writing system and that language which has produced so many great writers and poets and a society that venerates at all levels. I mean, that's, I think, a distinction in Europe and especially in Eastern Europe and in, in Russia where the average person knows the great poets of their country in their tongue and has not only read them, but has memorized them, and their part of their personality, their perception of the world is influenced by these great historical roots, which I wish we could begin in this country as well, to recognize some of our great writers, but also to better appreciate writers around the world, because in literate countries, it's always impressive to me, they know our writers as well as theirs. And that kind of breadth and appreciation, I think, helps minimize the adversity that governments tend to place between 
geographic locations that from people needn't be the case. And just finally, um, in terms of your 40 years or so within this field of dyslexia, what changes have you seen from when you entered the study and the field and to now? I think it is the proof that what was speculation, that there is a difference in the organization of the nervous system in the dyslexic individual, whether that person is in Italy, France, England, or the United States, that the biology is the same that this is a biological condition which also does not mean that it is untreatable. It is not refractory to intervention. Intervention early is optimal, but intervention changes the functioning in the central nervous system. The capacity to be able to see the brain, to see the brain in operation. We saw our first, what was then called EMI scan, and it was called EMI scan before it was called CT or CAT scan, because it was the, pro the process was owned by the Electrical Musical Instruments Company. So Angel Records had <laughs> the first imaging study. And those, of course, were very coarse when they first came out. And then the development of magnetic resonance imaging, which gave us you know, such beautiful pictures of what the brain in the living person was like. And now the functional imaging of PET and functional MRI provide for us a window on the unique differences between individuals. And most recently, the genetic leap, and our colleagues, especially in Colorado, that have done so much on the genetics of reading disorders, and the appreciation that we're not looking at single gene effects. There are more than one gene potentially responsible for the condition. And that if we look over a segment of the genome, the reason why people may differ in some of the extent of the manifestation and why the word spectrum that we heard this morning is so appropriate is that across that genome and in that section, a person may only have one portion that's affected. And as others, a much larger portion. And as a consequence, the degree of genetic expression differs from individual to individual. And that genetic understanding potentially gives us the power to treat. Thank you so much for all your wisdom and your years of Well, thanks. It's been great to do it with a pal. <laughs> well, it, we'll see you in, at least next year, hopefully, in New Orleans, if not before. I love that town. <laughs> It'll be a great conference. Thanks, Drake. My pleasure.